Wow, this was a really well-controlled fasting study, probably one of the most controlled fasting studies that I've ever seen. And it was looking at sort of a newer way of fasting that I think is very beneficial, particularly for visceral fat. The results speak for themselves, and we'll talk about exactly how they did this fasting so that you can apply it to your life. I'm certainly going to do this. In fact, by the time I've done this video, I've actually done it twice. And I really like how I feel with it. The coolest thing about this fasting study I'm going to talk about is it does fasting or has the subjects do fasting in a way that most of us probably do. Like if you're looking at doing fasting, you are probably doing it this way and it'll all make sense. Now, the first thing I want to kind of open up with is that we know that visceral fat is linked to cardiometabolic disease. Like it is a huge risk factor. There was a study published in Nature and it looked at 40,000 MRIs and it found that only visceral fat, when it comes down to fat tissue, was linked to cardiometabolic disease. So subcutaneous fat, like regular body fat, is a bad thing, it's not good, but visceral fat was the only thing directly linked with cardiometabolic disease. What does it have to do with fasting? Well, it just so happens that this fasting study really, really honed in on visceral fat. So this study was published in Obesity, and it was published like end of 2022, so it's a couple years old, but it's just now making the rounds because visceral fat is getting so like popular. It's, it's in the headlines a lot right now. So what they did is they did what is called protein pacing. Really cool. So the intermittent fasting plus protein pacing. I'll explain what that is. I think it's something that everyone watching this could apply. It's really, really cool. If you fast at all or, or you've tried something like this, just comment down below and let me know. I like to read through and, and kind of see. Plus, dropping a quick comment helps the algorithm out, helps get these videos out there. It really does help a ton, so I appreciate it. And also, we have new videos every day, so please do hit that subscribe button for up-to-date information all the time. Okay, so what this study did, 200 people, not a small study, okay? They had people do a heart-healthy caloric restriction diet, and it wasn't like aggressively calorically restricted. It was actually just, it was a decent diet, quite frankly. And then what they did is they had the other 100 people do what they called intermittent fasting with protein pacing, which sounds really weird, but it's actually just what you and I probably do realistically. And I'll explain what the difference is between that and intermittent fasting in a lot of other studies where it kind of gets frustrating, quite frankly. The most important thing to note is that both groups were isocaloric. They were matched for calories. So they consumed the same amount of calories over this eight week period of time. So calories were equated. They made sure they ate the same amount of calories. What was unique is they gave the fasting group. Now, listen up really closely here because this is where it's really important. They gave the fasting group two options. They had an option to do a 36 hour fast or a 60 hour fast once a week. Okay, so it wasn't even regular like intermittent fasting. Now, I know that most people watching, like you're probably not doing 36 hour fast once a week, but it might be something to consider, but they did something really weird with this. Something that you and I probably don't usually do is each day they fasted, they actually let them have 400 calories. So most people would just have like a small little protein snack. So it wasn't official fasting, but they were still going long periods of time and then just having one little snack. So let's say you did a longer fast. Let's say maybe you did 48 hours. It would almost be like, at the end of the first day, you're having a quick 400 calories, which is really hard. It seems brutal, but when you hear the results, it might make sense, it might be worth it, okay? But here's the part that I think is more like what you and I do. With this fasting study, one of the reasons it was so well controlled is they took a different look at this. They said, hey, let's monitor what you eat on the days you're not fasting. So they controlled for them to eat 1,800 calories per day with very specific macros. 35% protein, 35% carb, and 30% fat. So it ranged from 20 to 40 grams of protein with each meal. So they eat four meals on their non-fasting days. Okay, so four meals a day with protein space throughout the day, and then one to two days out of the week, aggressive fasting, okay? The reason this is so important is because most of the fasting studies that are out there, they would have them do what is called ad libitum. That would mean they would fast, and then on the other days, they would have them eat whatever they wanted to. There's a serious problem with that, and this is where the evidence-based community comes in and really kind of bashes fasting a lot. There is natural sort of rebound where you are going to try to overeat without even thinking about it to compensate for the caloric restriction from a fast. Okay, we see it in the rodent models, we see it in the humans, okay? It's just you naturally start eating more to compensate. 
when you fast, you do need to still remain in control on the days you don't fast. Okay, so fasting days, you're obviously in very good control because you're not eating, it's easy to control. Variables are isolated. But then when you go back to your normal days where you're not fasting, do not just go ad libitum. You do need to keep it under control. And that's what this study did, is they said, hey, we're less worried about what you eat on fasting days. We're less worried about that. That's the easy part. We're more concerned with what you do on non-fasting days. So I found this really, really fascinating and well-controlled. Now, the results at the end of eight weeks, get ready for this. Now, again, remember, calories were equated. So at the end of each week, they were at the same amount of calories per group, caloric restriction versus this unique kind of fasting. Now, one of the things I don't know if they did that I think is really, really, really important if you're going to be fasting longer than like 20 hours, please, for the love of all things good, get electrolytes in. We have all kinds of stressors coming out. So we have things that are depleting us and your insulin levels are lower when you're fasting and that's going to cause you to excrete more water. And remember that that is going to aid in fat loss if you're hydrated. Okay, that is important. Hydration is key for that. So I sip on electrolytes. Personally, I don't care which ones you use as long as they're healthy and they're good and they don't have a bunch of sugar in them. Personally, I don't use anything other than Element on the days that I'm fasting because I want my sodium intake a little higher. I want my potassium right where it's at and I want my magnesium right where it's at with Element. It was formulated much more for low carb and for fasting. So it really is the kind of quintessential fasting electrolyte. It also curbs my appetite on these longer fasts. So Bar none, that is the electrolyte that I would use 100% of the time. And that's me personally. Uh, because of that, I put a link down below if you wanna try them out. That's a sample variety pack link right there. So with any purchase, you get a free sample variety pack. I definitely recommend it. I mean, if you're fasting, just try it. You'll see a big difference in my opinion. Like I think you will notice that you're less hungry and you have more energy during a fast. So huge, huge shout out to them. So that link is down below. So both groups, both the caloric restriction and the fasting, they lost body fat, they lost visceral fat, they had improvements in lipids, and they both had great adherence. Like they didn't have the washout, they didn't have people dropping out. They did really well. Okay, but here's the results. Total weight loss. Fasting group, 8.2 kilograms. Caloric restriction group, 5 kilograms. Body fat, decrease of 8.5% in fasting group, decrease of 4.3% in caloric restriction group. Abdominal fat reduction, 23% reduction in the fasting group, 15.8% reduction in the caloric restriction group. Drum roll please, visceral fat reduction, 33% visceral fat reduction in the fasting group, 14% reduction in the caloric restriction group. And we're talking more than double the visceral fat loss. They lost a third of their whole visceral fat in eight weeks by doing this kind of diet. Now, the other really cool thing is their fat-free mass proportion increased 5.7%, where it only increased 3% with the caloric restriction group. So a 5.7% increase in the ratio of muscle to fat. For the amount of fat they lost, they built muscle, okay? Now, there's one more really interesting thing. The actual desire to eat, the, the need to like go to get food, went down 17% in the fasting group and went up 1% in the caloric restriction group. The fasting group got less hungry. They were eating the same amount of calories, remember? So how come they had 17% less desire to eat? I mean, if it's all just dictated by calories, it shouldn't matter, right? Kind of wild. They were under more control. That alone speaks volumes. Now we have to be also realistic here because there's a couple limitations, or there's really one main limitation, one thing I wish they tested. The limitation, this is a big one, is that they did not match protein intakes. Now, the group that was in the caloric restriction did their best to get protein intake where they wanted it, but the fasting group was the only group where it was decided how much protein they would consume. If I wanted to do this study again, I'd say, okay, this is really well crafted on the fasting side. We need to craft it better on the caloric restriction side to make it fair. So it needs to be like, you guys eat, eat the same amount of protein because there is a thermic effect of protein and there is an anabolic effect, an anti-catabolic effect of protein. So that might've preserved more muscle. At the end of the day, the fasting group actually ended up consuming more protein. So is that what caused them to have the good metabolic benefit? Possibly, okay. But this isn't necessarily to bash caloric restriction and lift up fasting. For me, I get more excited about, wow, this is an interesting way to fast. Like we, they, they laid out a playbook for us. They laid out a playbook that works really well. Fast for two days per week, ideally consecutively, and then do five days of somewhat caloric restriction with four meals per day with protein spaced out throughout the day. That's a pretty nice thing. And that's probably somewhat ancestrally accurate 
you get a big feast, you, you hunt something down, and then you have a few days worth of food, and then you got to go hunt again, right? It just makes sense. Now, the other limitation and thing that I wish they studied, I wish they looked at ketones, because when you get into this ketone deep state or deep state of ketosis where ketones are elevated, which you definitely would in a 36 or definitely in a 60 hour fast, we're seeing evidence that ketones are also sort of a proxy for how much visceral fat we're burning. So deeper in ketosis, when ketone levels are elevated, they're anti-catabolic, they protect the muscle, but also can drive more visceral fat burn. So there's a couple things that we probably could have done better, but we still have outlined a new style of fasting that could be really, really effective. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. See you tomorrow.